this data management activity as part of uh, the TL2 and Go projects. So in the last few months, we've been discussing and after having several rounds of discussions and after approaching to the several data management platform vendors, and after reviewing several data management platforms, we have decided to go with the AWIT data management platform and agreed to sign the contract with the AWIT people and uh, formulate a statement of work. And according to the statement of work, we have set some milestones and we need to execute those milestones according to the statement of work. And some of you might have seen that one from the note received by your project leaders and the project managers. Let me read out those milestones for the benefit of those people who have not seen them. And the, the milestone A, the project initiation, starting commitment, and initial plan for project mobilization. This is the project start. Uh, before going into these details, according to the statement of work, we have to initiate the activities in June 2012 and suppose it to complete all these milestones and the phases in next seven months to complete the project and to get started with our data management platforms. And after the milestone A, that's a project start, and we go with the milestone B, that's a detailed project plan, essentially we will aim at the design workshop and also the user interface workflows and the specifications and the initial data collection and analysis. We suppose to complete this one by end of month one. And the milestone C focuses on collection, provisioning, and integration of existing data sets, incremental delivery thereafter. That should be completed by month two. And the milestone D, the launch evaluation module with hope and tropical legumes to data and complete data protocol development and training that should be completed by month four. And the milestone E is all about the project launch review and final consulting report. And these are the milestones. We need to execute these milestones according to the timelines. So we have to keep this in our mind and work accordingly. Without your commitment and all of your active participation, this would not be an easy task at our end. So I request each and every one of you, please make your commitment and actively participate and in each and every phase of uh, the project activity. I'm sure the project leaders, Dr. Gauda and Dr. Sayer and the other project managers, they will walk through with us along with the data, the, the AWA data management team, John, Jim, Chad, and make sure that uh, we are going to execute these activities. According to the milestone A, we need to identify the team from the crusade side. So as part of that one, we have identified few people to get started with the activities and to fulfill the requirements of the project start, that's the milestone A. And we have identified Emmanuel Monio from the Tropical Legumes and the judge uh, for hope. They are, they are going to act like the project managers. The role of the project manager is to serve as the focal point of contract for the AWA project manager and communicate the status of the projects to the project sponsor. These two individuals are responsible for managing client resources, achieving consensus decisions across client stakeholders and ensuring deliverables are provided on time. And the user profile representatives are Puran Gao and the Jupiter for tropical legumes and SK Gupta, Olister, Mary for Hope. And Abhishek Rato is going to act like a data curator for both Hope and TL2. The user profile representatives will have direct knowledge and experience with the requirements and workflows of the target user profiles. They will actively engage in project requirements, design reviews, and testing. In addition, these personnel will closely work with the objective coordinators and project managers of both the projects. And the data manager, we will be hiring a new person. He will be shortly on our board. His name is Chukka Srinivasra. Till Chukka get on board, I request Tushar to be the point of contact. And the data manager directly works with AWA data analysts to optimize and provisioning of project data. And Pratik Modi is going to act like the IT manager who facilitates implementing technical requirements that may arise within the HOPE and TL2 environments and answer questions regarding the HOPE and TL2 environments that will enable AWA personnel to complete system or database integration initiatives. And 
as part of the first milestone, we have completed this one. And uh, according to these roles and responsibilities, I request all these individuals to coordinate and facilitate the entire activities and work actively with the other objective leaders and uh, the AVA to, to make sure this is going to be a successful in initiative. I'm sure this is going to be an intensive process, but with our commitment and uh, participating actively in each and every phase of the project, I'm sure we are going to make this activity as a successful event. And let's do it uh, together, colleagues. Thanks, Sayed. Thanks. Everybody is there, so we have to start this one. Welcome. Yeah, Sayed well, is here. I was in another meeting. The real class, too. It's a busy day. Yeah. Thank you, colleagues. With that, I, I request uh, John to just give us. At least agreement or yeah. you just jump. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, I was in this conference. Was it a conference or what? Press briefing. Press briefing. Ah, the press briefing. Uh, about Rio Plus 20. Where we had the Deputy Director General of UNEP, DG of Big Crop, and the rest of the CG centers. So I've just come. Uh, John, welcome. Thank you very much. John, welcome. Philip, welcome. On behalf of the Equisap team and Hope in Nairobi. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So shall we introduce the others or should we just go? Oh, no, I may yeah. not listen to interviews. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, Henry, who is in a corner there, I think it's come back from Uganda, feeling cold. Objective leader of our project, objective number four. Dave Harris, who has been in uh, CRP 1.1 meeting. And uh, representing TL2 on the ground here is Ganga Rao. So that's the team. Alistair is coming back, who is uh, the objective leader of number five of Hope. Good morning, the team in Western Central Africa. Good morning, team in IITA. How is the night in Siat Kali? <laughs> and good afternoon, our colleagues in Patanchero. And with that note, Philip, can you tell how many of the virtual participants participating in this meeting? Um, about 15. Oh, wonderful. I mean, if there are 15 virtual participants are participating in this meeting, that's really good. Yeah, that's terrific. And by the way, I think using the virtual meetings is going to be a very effective tool as we move forward because the interactions need to be like iterative and frequent. And small groups or big groups, we need to realize that jumping into a meeting is a good idea, um, visual. So should I begin? Oh, yes. Be before. John starts this one. I request all of you, please feel free to post your comments, suggestions, whatever comes to your mind. And uh, the moderator will read that one. And at the presentation, John is going to address those questions, comments, or suggestions. Please, guys, there really please do that one. Here I'm looking for me. His name is Gospel from AATF. Oh, Gospel of Do you know him? Do yeah. you see him? He thinks we're in the next room. <laughs> So what I've prepared is a, a bit of introduction, just because for some people this will be the first time they've encountered this idea, and so I've got a bit of a concept, and then uh, basically we'll jump right into a, an online demonstration of the existing platform with some data loaded that have come from different places, and uh, hopefully this will elicit both awareness but also questions, and that's the purpose. So uh, this morning, one of the things I want to start with at a very high level, uh, as I think some of you may know, I, uh, my career began at CIMIT, and actually I was here at ICRA, my office was just there, and uh, my perception of the CG system is from that side of things. I went on to Texas A&M, 
But then due to some, actually some interest in innovation, we started a small company in 1999 called Aware. Uh, Syngenta was sufficiently enamored with our things that they actually seconded me from my own company for, and moved us to Switzerland for three years. And then we went back to Colorado after that, and where we have been persistent with what we'll be showing you today. But this vision comes from what I think of as a, a, a situation that has emerged in many institutions that collect agricultural and oddly public health is included. We do thin, some things in uh, like Uganda just now with the malaria. Uh, and it has to do with institutional memory of spatially diverse data. What happens is, is all projects collect an incredibly rich amount of data, but due to kind of a lack of the right sort of a platform, invariably once the project closes, those data become inaccessible. And this is a problem, and the problem is a huge asset if you turn it to an opportunity. In other words, if you have 20 years of soils data from every soils that's been collected, sent to a wet chemistry lab, this becomes an enormous resource. So this is what we're about. So when we talk about accountability, transparency, and visibility, it has to do with the idea that you are able to show off what you've actually done. You can show where you've collected field trial information and, and where uh, adoption is taking place, because as you know, many of the donors now are squeezing projects, saying, look, we don't want activity, we want outcome. We want to know how many farmers have taken up the suggestions and the promotions that have been made, whether it's a rotation, whether it's a soil, uh, um, uh, soil amendment. Uh, and then there's this idea that Gates is also pushing to build on the Gates Foundation, who is supporting AWARE separately. We are actually doing like what we're doing for ICRSAT and these projects. We're actually doing it directly for the agricultural program in the Gates Foundation. We have a three-year project with them underway now. And the idea is evidence-based accountability, and it, it's, it began with a very simple thing. You know that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, these two very wealthy individuals, are traveling around the world asking other billionaires to move money to philanthropic causes. And these guys are saying, well, what difference have you made? And Bill pulls out reports, and he says, see, this report says we've impacted 100,000 farmers. But these other gentlemen usually are business people. And they say, really, show me. And of course, what happens is, at that point, there isn't a list of 100,000 names or villages. Or, and all of a sudden, there's this question. And so they are asking for something that, coincidentally, we have been building on. So what we talk about evidence-based accountability, we are talking about what a where and what we believe and what we have architected our database is the focal point of all of this effort in public health and in agriculture is the rural farm family. It's the family, the plot, the, maybe perhaps the clinic, but it's this idea that the aggregation of what you observe at those is a very potent signal. But if you only have the aggregation and you can't dive down to the granular level, you actually lose something in the translation, the proof, the evidence. So we talk about building transparency. Obviously, this is going to be a very visual interface that you will see. And yes, we're building institutional memory. Towards this, actually, it reduces the risk of what you're doing because you simply have so much information at your fingertips that you can sort by geography, by time. So location and time become powerful instruments to connect lots and lots of data. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If you have a demonstration trial in a location, you can focus on what you're good at. You can focus on measuring the things from that trial. You can know that by just having that location, you know what district you're in, you know the census, you know the weather data, you know the soils from the soils research, you know all of the rest of the contextual information, so you can focus on what you're good at. So we talk about all of these other uh, benefits, the increased productivity, the stewardship of natural resources, and then more importantly, the idea, site-specific targeting interventions giving advice back. So it's not just one direction going to a central repository that you access. SMS and other tools start to pull from that content and deliver very specific information. It gets kind of exciting in that space. What we call LIME, &E, Location Intelligent Monitoring and Evaluation Capabilities. Real time. These smartphones, $100 Android phone, has GPS built in. You can push a survey to it, so you could be working anywhere in the world. You go online come up with some questions, you push it to your enumerators on the ground, spread across Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia. They are answering, answering and asking those questions the next day. When they hit submit, you see the answers right there. So this concept of real time, being able to collect the data, kind of means you don't have to collect two hours worth of interview one time because you know it's so much trouble to come back. You can collect 
appropriate seasonally structured information as you're going. So before planting, you're talking about inputs. During the season, you're talking about protection, maybe some top dressing if the weather's really good. Toward harvest, you're talking about harvest things, rather than asking all of those things one time. It offers some opportunities to kind of subtly shift the accuracy, frankly, and you see it in real time. As you know, the Gates Foundation is asking you all as part of these uh, uh, projects, Hope and Teal 2, to make your data more accessible, a global public good. But that doesn't mean all your data. You choose which data you want to expose. The platform has all of the right uh, systems so that you can say, this user profile cannot see actual on-farm demonstrations, but can see the aggregation of them by village. This user profile can only see the aggregation because maybe it's a policy profile at the district level or the county level. These things are possible. Now, the new insight is an interesting perspective that I just alluded to. Some of you, I am sure, have encountered farm families that, frankly, are suffering from malaria. And it probably is just outside your ability to just understand how that affects labor. It, it just does. And all of a sudden, because of context, maybe some malaria data can come in, and all of a sudden you realize that during certain times of the year, they do not have enough labor to perform some really smart agronomic practice. And you knowing that ahead of time means that your recommendation perhaps will adjust for that. My point being, again, new insight. You will have access to information that you simply didn't, it just was not possible, there was no way. And mind you, this is the lessons that I learned. I'm an agricultural climatologist. When I was sat here at IPRA, my biggest frustration, was I knew that the most, one of the most important channels to get aggregate information to were the economists. But it was really difficult because the agronomics, the plant breeding, the soils, all of these very granular things was too granular. The economists needed a way to see it aggregate, but it really wasn't very possible to do that in a rolling sense. You could do it as a report, but it didn't arm them with information that allowed them to adjust maybe for a drought in one part of the country versus another. All my point is, is that this new insight is very valuable. I think it will offer, and this is why we want to iterate meetings, because new things will emerge as the project goes along. And finally, the persistent value of data is something that is near and dear to my heart. When I first started my career at Senate, I was very excited to know that there were 20 years of international spring wheat yield trial because I was doing crop simulation modeling. And it was awkward because they hadn't organized the data to be queried in, a, in that time series manner. It was very difficult to get the data out slice by slice. And the idea is, in a system like this, so you can slice the data by geography, by time, how you wish. It allows you to answer and address very different questions. So what we've effectively done, this is kind of a little bit of the technology. We have taken the strength of a true enterprise relational database system. This is Microsoft SQL Server. This is what, this is what Walmart runs on. Billions of transactions. Okay, this thing can scale. And we've taken something that people know of as GIS. But GIS, as you know right now, is mostly a layer-based system with a specialist running the engine. Very valuable for the research, but it's not transactional. And so by putting the two together, which is the spatial primitives, which are now built inside of these enterprise databases, we were able to get an event-based system. And what I mean by an event, every observation you take happens someplace at some point in time. By having those two characteristics, we can connect all data, because there is a common set of attributes in every data. It's very agile. Part of what we will emphasize, I use the word, and this is an important term, data provenance. And that means if you have a person working in northern Zambia collecting these data, and they go into the system, the system will record who not only collected and kind of approved the data, but who owns the data, because it might be Icrasat. It'll inform the metadata such that you know what every variable is, because the loss of that makes the data, of course, not usable to the global access. Because if you don't know what the variable is, you don't know what the units are, you cannot use it. If you don't have the provenance, you cannot cite it. So by building provenance in, it actually makes the strength of all research that's going on, it makes what you do more valuable, because you will simply be referenced. I mean, and George will say your name because you're the one who authorized. You, you see what I'm saying? It's sort of like a publication. You get cited. Well, think of it this way from your data. We track it. Obviously, it scales. This is an enterprise system. I've mentioned this concept of context, and here's where things get really important. 
As scientists, we are looking for patterns, we are looking for processes that allow us to create causality where we can say, adding this much phosphorus, this much nitrogen, with this variety, you should achieve this deal, this, this yield. You see what I just did? I went from causality, right? I did research and I discovered what was needed, and now I'm predicting. And with prediction, the economists can argue from the policy the value of the whole agricultural value chain pieces that need to have investment. You can see where we're headed here. It's quantitative. So about this technology, we talk about targeting. We're going to talk about how to capture and collect your data more systematically and, and make it more effective so you're not sending spreadsheets back and forth where you even lose track of which one is the, the most current, the gold standard. I mean, this is a problem. It's just, it's, it's, it's universal. Everybody, I mean, I have that problem sometimes. Cleansing and provisioning the data for LI has some specific things we, we will do. We will insist on providence and metadata. We will insist, obviously, on location information being correctly acquired. Obviously, like any cloud computing, cloud-hosted solution, security is always important. But I would ask of you, most of you all use internet banking right now. So your personal financial stuff, you go online and do things. It's really secure. So we can assure you that for every user profile, they will only have access to the parts that you say they should. And also, the system of authorizing data to be made available is also something you will decide. So if you're waiting to publish a paper, you can put the data in a, in a holding for a year if you want before it becomes available to other user profiles. It's, it's, this is data administration. That's up to the users. Now obviously, it's accessible all the time, 24-7, any internet connection. <coughs> and we look for feedback. And this bottom comment relates back to some of those earlier comments. We actually heard one of the guys say this, and I thought it was very apropos, which is simply put, if your data are not accessible to the rest of the world, their value is only whatever you're able to extract from it. Okay, does that make sense? And all of a sudden though, and, and my best example is always going back to soils. Collecting soil samples properly is difficult, right? You have to mix the right collection. Getting the wet chemistry done is expensive. It doesn't change that fast. Yes, land use will adjust the nitrogen. Yes, it'll adjust the organic carbon. But even that becomes a good thing for a student, perhaps, to do their MSC on. But then they have to have access to the soil sample collected two, three, and four years ago. Collect the data, pay for it once, put it in a system, and make it accessible. It's suddenly very valuable. OK, this is really the most important concept that I just want to throw out there on a high level. We use the word data curation to curate data is having a very important two-pronged definition. Not only must it be safe in a digital way, it has to be accessible, because that's the only way that it's valuable. Okay, so we're using the word curate this way, and by the way, from this definition you see down there below from the University of Illinois, they're even calling it, and you see it there say, and this new field. In other words, this is an old word, I mean, we all know what to curate things are. But we're making very clear, this is not archiving, okay? And I actually ran into that very interestingly in, in Washington, D.C. about um, two, three months ago. Uh, the Oak Ridge Laboratory was there. And they have a phenomenal data archive. But as soon as I said this, they went, because they realized they have archived the data, but they can't even access it. I mean, it's a major work effort, two weeks, to pull things out. And yet they know they haven't. And it's an interesting, so this is important terms. So Icrosat is now kind of leading. This is something new, but this is you can talk about data curation. This is what it means. <clears throat> and finally, this diagram is meant to now focus on this concept of what's going to happen here with the design workshop and the end user applications. I'm not so worried about right now because those will emerge. But we want to spend some time on how to help you with the data capture side. <coughs> now, what that means is, is that we're going to study working with you your regular workflow. What are you doing now? And the purpose is not to interrupt your workflow. It's to optimize it. So if you're already collecting data on paper, maybe we suggest tablets or smartphones. If you're collecting it in, in Excel, maybe nothing changes other than to agree that all of it has to be structured in a structured way inside Excel. And then we just build a synchronized way to upload that Excel spreadsheet straight into the database. Okay? So we're going to work with the data side. At the same time, we're going to work with the workflow side. Now, the other side of the equation is what we started in Dubai in December. We went through the requirements, and George, remember that? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it this way, because George will agree. It was really interesting. We had uh, some senior people from Microsoft, right? We had quite a group. 
And when we started off with the requirements, and this is entirely predictable, when they started listing all the uses of the data, it was all about how they would use it as, as scientists, really. But after, what, maybe four hours, all of a sudden this board that stretched from all the possible users, so from the scientist side to students to extension workers to policy makers, all of a sudden the <coughs> stickers that were going up describing how I want to use it got about, the list was this long. And then the list grew. In other words, this data is more valuable to this incredible population of potential users than it ever could be to just the scientist that's collecting it. And that's what happened, yes? It was impressive. I mean, people left that meeting going, wow, I hadn't occurred to me that I just <laughs> do. You want to make a comment? Yeah, John, what you're saying is true, really. It, it was quite an eye-opener, both to Sedeke, who was selling TL2, and, and to myself. And we shared this over me, that we really, we've worked as scientists all these years, and yet we ne it never occurred to us that the data we collect can be used by so many people mm -hmm. far removed from our immediate yeah. immediate context as scientists. And we then saw the value of this tool, the value of really doing things this way. And um, yeah. No, we, I, I just have to tell you that I'm going to stretch it even further by pointing out that in the Gates Foundation, I, I'm not going to say it has anything to do with because of aware or anything. But I'm saying to you that they are now realizing because they started to merge agriculture and health. Because they, it's occurring to them, it's the same family they're trying to influence, right? It's that same rural family who has malaria issues or dengue or yellow or sanitation and other issues, and they need economics, they need agriculture. And it's the same family, so they should be talking. And you can see then that clearly the opportunity to expand the user base, to allow you all to see malaria data, just to adjust your economic models for labor availability. I mean, how perfect is that a fit? It's a fit because they collect that data. We will connect. So this is an important concept. <coughs> back to this particular slide. What AWARE is pro propositing and is saying to you all is, look, this is a solution that is meant to be as complete as we can envision it today. But we will continue to work with you iteratively and make sure we have not overlooked possibilities for this. You know, targeting and analysis tools, making the data collection more optimal, doing proper evaluation, but allowing lots of people to do evaluation. Because as an acclimatologist, I am not going to go into the genetics of plant breeding. I'm not going to dig into too deep on the agronomic field trials, but I want the output. Because I can synthesize the output for a direction maybe with climate change simulations or something like that. Or maybe you want to feed the data to the economists in a way that they can appreciate it and make it coming in like all the time. So these are important things that we do, and this information is readily available when you log in, so no problem. About the final slide then, this concept of location intelligence. Now look, for agriculture, it is the key. If you are going to advise a farmer on what to do, you are not telling him the average best thing to do. You're actually telling him the best thing, right? Because nobody wants the average. They want really good. So location in agriculture is absolutely important. And it happens to allow you to leap to all the rest of the data. So that's a very good thing. Here's a statement that I feel free to just use, but we think that what LI leads to is actionable insight at the point of decision. In this case, it really is the farmer, but it's also the agro dealer. What crop protection to stock? What fertilizers to stock? You see what I mean? At every point in the decision making process, location actually influences it. You don't make blanket recommendations. I've just come from an agro workshop. And in Tanzania, I understand that there is a geologic formation with phosphorus. And so some soils are not low in phosphorus. Many soils are very low in phosphorus and see a huge response to even 20 kgs. So the average recommendation might be 10, but of course 10 isn't appropriate anywhere. It's either you need 20 or you don't need any, or very little. It's a very interesting truth that the location part is very manageable and very important. Okay, so the demonstration, and I'm assuming I'm still online, so it should work. I'm going to quickly go through kind of some modules. I'm going to show you some things, and then I'm assuming maybe some questions are starting to come in, and, and we can make uh, this a lot more interactive because I don't want to just sit up here and that way. So there's a monitoring module. I'll show you what this does in terms of being able to look at data as it's collected and submitted. There's an evaluation module which has some analytics and et cetera, and this is what we will start to configure for your purposes. What do you want to be able to do with it? What do different user profiles need? 
Because when they log in, they will see tools differently, which makes sense, right? Because software is overwhelming when it's only one look. You open it up and you're just overwhelmed with buttons, and that can be difficult, especially if you're an extension worker who needs something quickly. Maybe that person only needs two buttons, two different things they want to do. We can set that up. Uh, obviously, this is an important thing. Um, we will show you some things that work here very well. But the IT side of this is no longer the issue, folks. This is, it is now more the will to just start using it. So mm -hmm. you can click things and put them on web pages, and it'll be a live link into the database. So as that data changes, the map will change on these, and I'll show you that. What we're talking about is your data. This is TL2 does this kind of data. Hope does this data. You have field location, you have crops and varieties and inputs and markets and storage of all this. We are suggesting that we're going to make sure that this kind of data is also made available to you. We know that predictive models have a lot of value, but can you imagine if these sorts of things were available and readily accessible with loaded data where people can play with the parameters and see the outcomes and test their own ideas for their area of responsibility? We think the mobile surveys are a really smart way forward because if the enumerator is able to enter the data directly and there's no paper that goes to a data entry person, we think because the responsibility is there, you're going to get cleaner data. The statistics show it's much cleaner, so this is a good thing. Lots of things going on here, and then this is the focus. It's all those end user applications. So here's a data universe. Think about it. You guys are good with certain data, but look at all the other things that might be whether might be readily available to you. And by the way, um, if you wish, I can give you this PowerPoint. Oh, this, yes. oh, yeah. this is just another one of those schematics that sometimes people like to do to lay out this vision that says, look, it's in the cloud, and it's what you've asked for. So you're going to have analytics, you're going to have data, and it's just available through your web browser. And our mission, then, this is a statement about us. We believe that the transformation of complex data into actionable insight will make a substantive contribution to your purpose as well, because we're aligned in that purpose. We have exactly the same idea. Help build healthy communities, sustainable activities, environments. These are all things that are, are the same. We speak that same. OK, what I'm going to do, uh, I guess I can take some questions. I don't know what you want to uh, jump into the demonstration. Should we? No, why, why don't we have the demonstration? Okay. Let me see how much real estate I have. Okay, when you log into the system, and right now, by the way, and I'll show it to you at the end, all of you can log into the weather tool. Have any of you done that, George? Have you looked at the weather tool yet? Yes, I have. Okay, when you log in right now, we'll, and you can do it if there's no charge, it's part of the Bill and Melinda Gates project with us, you will have one module, weather. Right now, you're seeing that there are two additional modules. That's kind of how it works. There'll be other modules will come as, as the, it's one platform. So as that platform improves, all people who are using it get the improvements. So I'm gonna jump into the monitoring module. And what I've elected to start with here, um, we have a, uh, I put together just a sample on-farm integrated cell fertility management survey. Just a very simple light touch survey, because I was at it this agro. And then down here I have some, it's actually a lot of real survey going on with the Strasse project. They are looking at uh, adoption of a uh, flood tolerant rice. And what I want to show you is something that's kind of fun to do. So uh, one morning at the Windsor Country Club, which is where this was held, and I can click this magnifying button right here, and it's going to take me exactly to that observation. So every field that you click the button on, it will take you right to where the GPS says I did it. So you can see I was sitting in a room right there at the Windsor Country Club. Now, I also took a photograph. So when you look, I pretended that there was, I was going to introduce a hectare of maize planting. It's the wrong variety, Catamonia. It's wet there, but that's okay for now. Uh, what day I was going to plant it, and I came down here, and I was going to intercrop with common beans, and here was where I was going to plant this. They probably would get a little annoyed. But you see my point. I literally stood there. Let me see if that is there. I stood there in the back behind the meeting room and just filled in the survey, I mean, it was pretend, and took a photograph. And that tracks. So that's just in the database. And it's synchronized. In this case, it took about 40 minutes before it showed up online. So when I pushed the button here, about 40 minutes later, there it was. Which means, George, if this was your survey, you could have logged in and seen what that enumerator was seeing. So if there's a pest problem in the field, the person can <coughs> okay? 
So let me just uh, back up now because I've jumped all the way to a very granular piece. Let me say this. What you're looking at in this um, software, we, we typically lay our modules out like this. There's a map space here. There's a table space here and a graphic space there. That will be a common theme. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if you want to, you can actually you know, do things like, well, I don't need the map anymore. You just close it. And if you need it again, you just come up here uh, and say, go, put it back. Okay, so no problem. I mean, you can move things around. Because sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, by the way, this is really nice to have the, this as the graphic presentation because it, you know, when you connect to a projector, it squishes your screen and makes things very jumbled. Okay, so a couple of things. If I click version 9, which is, we, we, we just were updating things a bit, but if I click all of them, what you're going to see is that it will immediately know to go out, and you see it's zooming all the way out in the map because you'll notice up here in Colorado there is a survey. Before I left Colorado, I filled one out sitting in my office. So here is the picture of what it looks like. Ah, it's not gonna, it hasn't loaded again. There it is. This is the view outside my office. And by just clicking the button, you saw it expand so I could view all of that survey. And then you notice over here that it added one more day, right? Because now all of a sudden I have the 23rd of May when I took the picture. If I turn off that one, it will disappear because it's only available through that and you see the distribution. So in the chart window, you can actually look at the distribution of all your attributes. Now this is very important because, again, I'm, I'm talking about light touch surveys. So there's about 12 surveys on my phone here. One of them might just be for pests. One of them might be very specific. So the enumerator in the field may only want to, I mean, only need to run three of them, or maybe one. And the point is, is that I have access to all the data. So if I come down here and, and I just choose um, that's my, uh, variety, it just lists all the varieties that we happen to name. So I was being funny the other day. I just wrote a really good one. You see what I mean? Put in text, or you can put in something very real. This is actually Saudi, is a cassava variety for this one right here. And so this was something we filled in during the evening cocktail with two guys from Zambia, okay, from the Agro Project. You don't see anything on the map because there's nothing there. It's very far south. My point is, there's not much data in this little practice survey, so I'm going to turn it off. And by just turning it off, it will now zoom to where the data are. So now I have multiple surveys. This one is real data, or it's actually been anonymized, but it's, it's some real data that's collected, okay. And what you're seeing down here, this is all of the surveys. Let me turn that off. This is all of the uh, surveys we have in this particular sample set. I can come over here and say, well, let's look at it by variety. Let's look at it by seed source. Okay. Then you might say, but are there any patterns? This is Orissa and Bihar states in India. So you could come down here and you could say, you know what? I only want to know what it looks like in Bihar. And so I am dynamically eliminating and segmenting my survey. And then you can say, okay, well, that's interesting, but I wonder what does it look like for just the female farmers in Bihar? And then you realize, whoa, they only had five surveys. So maybe now you know to send a message out to the enumerators in Bihar and say, look, I think you need, you're, you're missing too many female farmers. In other words, course corrections. Mm -hmm. While the data is being collected, you can actually see it, send out a message to enumerators and say what's going on. Maybe there's a cultural reason. Maybe you only have male enumerators. They're not allowed to talk to females. I don't know. I'm saying you are seeing your data as it's being collected because as soon as it synchronizes now, these smartphones, is that the, the visit of anyone? It's okay. There's somebody looking for me, so <laughs> careful. Um, okay, so the, the point is, is that this... Uh, monitoring module is all about the collection side of data. Now, for the science side, say the on the on station trials, where you have more detailed data, you could actually use a, a tablet and just fill it in as you go, and it's it's in the database. For wider adoption surveys and stuff, maybe a phone might be enough. But this allows the data to go directly into the database. Okay, and you'll notice up here that you can filter it by dates, EP. We have a survey in India right now that has more than 20,000 entries. It's very big. So we've invented ways of showing it on the screen where 
depending on the level of zoom, it will disaggregate the data. So at a high level, it will say there's 345 here, a little box. And then as you zoom in, it'll spread them out on the land where they actually are. In other words, there's, there's no really, there's no really, it scales, okay? So don't fear that. All right, so that's the monitoring module. I'm going to jump into the evaluation module. Okay. Now in the evaluation module, I have multiple projects. Now, the interesting thing about a project, of course, is that I'm able to, you know, I mean, I can save it, so I'm building on it. You can also do things like share it. So it may be that you, we end up with a, uh, you know, you have a person who's really good technically, and you, that person builds up a module, and then you share it with all the program officers who need the common data. Okay? So that's no problem. Now you'll notice that what just happened here, here's India, and it says the plot yield is 2131. And you notice it's the whole country. What has just happened is, I have selected an attribute there, and it defaulted to the country resolution. So it just aggregated all of the data that was collected at that point level, which you'll find out in a moment, and presented it as a national average. By just coming up here and selecting, look, I would like to see it at the uh, level one. In India, they are states, correct? So now all of a sudden, it's going to average it to the state, and you'll see that there aren't many. I mean, there's only one state that has the data from this particular uh, collection, okay? And then you can say, well, okay, what about the next level, which I believe is district, is that correct? In other words, the data that you have at the more granular, it is very simple to see it at the aggregate. And so here you're looking at, and by just moving the mouse, you notice that it's telling me which district, which number, okay? Getting lots of feedback. And then if you want to see it at the most detailed level, you can pull it all the way down to the point level. And what you're going to see here, this is the baseline survey, and in this instance, they're anonymized by geography. What that means is, is that the village was recorded, but not the GPS. So we have provided them as just a random cluster around the village. So if I zoom all the way in, like this, you'll see that this cluster of dots is kind of just randomly around the village. Okay, whoops. Can, yes. Sure. Yeah, I guess. I mean, you have been giving us and so on. Does it also feed into data in numerical? Absolutely. Okay. What I wanted to do, I'm trying to, and it's a really good question. The, the point of your question is to say, okay, you want to do some analysis with these numbers. Mm -hmm. what, what we wanted to show is the visualization, okay. just yeah. to start with. Yeah, now, the, where I want to jump to first, though, before we jump to the analysis, this little project only has a certain things in it that I have selected for demonstration. So you see I've got sort of district level, area under production, you notice there's some VDSA data that were available. Here's some district level population from this uh, VDSA. And up here, we grab some state level data on some malaria that we found online, just to kind of show the mix of things that you can do. However, it may turn out that you want to go back to that data universe and select something. So when you click Add, depending on your login, the user profile, you will have access to all kinds of other data that are out there. And I mean access, I mean access. So if you decide, now some of these are national data, so it doesn't fit. Strasses or point data, I mean, there's some things here that, you know, this is just meant as a demonstration. But let's say you want to look, you want to bring in some FAO stat data, which again is national. This is what's accessible by just this button, okay? If you want, for example, some information from the World Bank uh, development indicators. What's happening is, is you can pull from that global contextual resource any of these characteristics and bring them into your research. So part of what will be going on, and when we talk about data curation, these data are publicly available now, but you get them as a spreadsheet. In this case, you're pulling them in by variable. Of course, all the geography and all the metadata, if you want to know, you know something about um, where the data came from, et cetera, you would come over here, right mouse click, go to properties, and it, that's probably not a good one to show on that one. Um, let's see this one. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't do it on the. And there it starts to tell you exactly where it came from. Okay, so you have the provenance sitting there all the time. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, let's see, what do I want to do? So I've shown you the idea of this point level information. And if I just change this resolution then. Pardon? Ah, see, I've never met him, so I don't know what he is. Perhaps he wants to come in. <laughs> Welcome. Okay, so here what I've done is I've just taken the average of all of those plot level data and pulled it to a village. Hello. This cost a lot of money. Thank you. Yeah? Yes. Okay. At the village level, what you're able to see now, again, the feedback from the village, you're able to uh, uh, read this sentence that says, I've aggregated my points to the village. I'm looking at specific attribute of plot yield here, and I'm looking at the average of, in this case, the year. And then the, the filter button would indicate how many years of data there are. So it's actually average two years of data. What that means then is that you can also change this and say, well, I would prefer to look at this information by year. So now what will split out, and it's not very impressive just because it's a line of one to two years, but here you're looking at the average of these villages across the year. The point is about this sort of information is when you come into it, and I, I don't know exactly which of these is the best uh, map to um, pull up. Here I'm loading the VDSA maze total area. And I will look at that. Yeah, we'll just pull it, we'll aggregate it up to the state because this is uh, detailed data. And I believe there are more years of data here. Point is, you can start to look at it across time. There you go. And what I want to do here is start to pivot the data. I believe this has more than one year. I'll load a demo here of more global data. These demonstration data were here, this sample. So here is the FAO World Bank data. Here you're looking at ground net total production. This is by country. It's going to map the whole world. Ground net from the FAO country data stat, FAO stat. She might say, okay, look, I'm really not interested in the whole country. So you come up to the filter, maybe turn them all off, and say, you know what, I'm really only interested in Eastern and Southeastern Africa. And that quickly, those data will be filtered from that very large database for just your target area. I'm just trying to show some of the different pieces. Some of the download capabilities, you hit this button, this will come down as a spreadsheet, properly identified. Again, one of the purposes of this tool is not to interrupt your workflow, especially at the scientist level. You all have access to SAS, you have access to other tools that you know how to really do your analyses. This tool is not designed to do anything but complement that. So if one of the requirements is that someone uses, uh, what's one of the, uh, SPSS, it may be that we just build an export tool that takes it to directly SPSS format for you. Yeah. Okay. You see how you see our purpose is to curate the data, and to not interrupt your analysis. So that, that addresses one of your questions. Now, some of the analysis that we can do right now is actually rather simple. So here you see something that uh, uh, done in the past: rice and malnutrition. We could look at rice total production area, and in a way, I almost don't want to demo because it's so simple. But it's the idea that. You can take data from very different sources by just dragging and dropping it into a, another folder. Those two variables will show up in here. So when we look at different things, like if you wanted to calculate the series of, say, um, grain legume index, 
You notice that by just tagging them, they show up here as another item for you to be able to do something with. And then from that point on, you can come to uh, the calculation tool. And you can build, if you will, a new operation whereby you, I'm going to give it a new name, just test one, where we can take any of the variables in that list, multiply, divide, and calculate, and you can build out, if you will, a new variable. And of course, that's spatial by time at this point, all right? So this, this sort of an idea here allows you to create, if you will, indexes. Now, what I'm going to jump to are some data that are, these data here are very general, and so it's hard to ask a good question from them. However, this tool, this part right here, is something that is actively being looked at right now in Uganda. Now, this is a health application, but you all will really understand this. So, Ministry of Health distributes the insect, insecticide-treated nets, long-term long insecticide-treated nets, to the population of Uganda. And when I first click it, as before, it came in as a national, so Uganda will color. And all I have to do, switch that to, in this case, it's at the district level. They changed their number of districts, that's why you see 80 to 112. They went from 80 in 2009 to 112 in 2010, and next year they're going to be 142. So the data are getting more and more granular, and we manage the different sets. Okay, so some of you who have dealt with GIS and things where you know how difficult this is just to sort of use, but okay. So here are the ITN distributions. So this is insecticide treated nets. Makes perfect sense. However, if you go to the statistics department, you might say, well, okay, what about the population of the districts? You get one measure. And so you may say to yourself, okay, this is where the Uganda population is. Am I distributing the nets proportional to the population? Right? It seems a very common sense question. You could calculate it right there. You could just say, okay, let's do a, under Uganda Bureau of Statistics, we're going to enter a ratio. We're going to take the nets distribution of 80 districts, and we will divide that by, oops, we will divide it by the uh, population, right? So it's extremely simple. But you have just it's calculated. An analysis. Pardon? It's an analysis. Yes. You have just calculated. See. Go ahead, please. <laughs> See, in the case that we want, we are looking at is like uh, after we aggregated the data sets, and we are seeing this as a data repository. And at the same time, the system also providing us an opportunity to go for the data analysis. Mm -hmm. So, how are we going to do this? One? Are we going to write the processors for each analytical tool? Otherwise, are we integrating any external software? That's one part. And other than that, we are also allowing external individuals to download the data in multiple formats and play it into their data analytical systems. For example, there is a data set. I can go for the analysis on my or give it data management file. What do you do? Yeah. And other than that, I can download that one into multiple formats, maybe SPSS or whatever, maybe I can play them. So how are we integrating this data analysis part into the system? What kind of mechanism are we looking for? Okay, I'm not, maybe I'm not quite understanding the, the real, you're asking a very specific question, I may not yes. be understanding it. I'm suggesting that what we're looking to do is provide some analysis capabilities because sometimes it's just easier to do it right here, right? I mean, it was fast and simple and maybe even some things. And then I'll explain some complex things that we can do. At the same time, what we don't want to do is interrupt a scientist, for example, who really knows what they're doing and they may have some complex mathematics that they want to perform. The output of that complex mathematics, however, will probably be formatted in this case by district, right? Because that's what the, the data came in as district data, maybe from the census, from this, and then they use the tool to aggregate the demonstration plot results by you know, yield response to phosphorus by district, and now they have district level data, they, they perform their analyses. What we're suggesting from the perspective of Ipresat that analysis result would be something you would want to upload back to the platform. Yeah, that's right. What, what kind of capability, what kind of analytical tool are we looking for for the whole frontier to do? I don't to... think that's been decided yet. That's okay. part of the design discussion. Okay. Because from our perspective, 
we think that there will be, like this, a generic calculator is somewhat useful. Mm, probably trying to replicate SAS would be a really bad idea. Okay? I mean, yes. on, this is a company that does really powerful statistics. <laughs> we shouldn't. And besides, then do the user profile assessment. How many people use SAS? Yes. Not that many. How many people might want to calculate an index? Uh -huh. Let me tell you what's happening in Uganda just now. This is, this is real. They're seeing this. What's happening in Uganda is if you come down to, and I'm not sure I actually have the most current one up here. The purpose of what they asked uh, to do, and they do this about every 10 years, and not just Uganda, by the way, it's all the areas with malaria. They calculate a malaria risk, and it's a very complex mathematical calculation because the, the provenance, you know, how, how frequently, the, I'm sorry, the, um, the actual malaria uh, blood smear counts is one source of information. The, obviously, malaria deaths is one. Uh, there's a whole series of prevalence data, which is people reporting that they're sick. You know, the clinics literally reporting so many, you know, mothers that are pregnant, uh, babies that have come in, what age they are. There's all kinds of prevalence data. And then, confusing it all, of course, you have control information, right? You have indoor residual spraying, you have distribution of bed nets, and these are things that are confounding, if you will, the risk, right? Because if you just took it by the number of people reporting getting sick, you would maybe be in the wrong place, because if you did a really good control effort in a place where malaria is very intense, all of a sudden you're missing the spot. So they, this calculation is very complex. In the past, they used to throw all that data over the wall, <coughs> some analysis came back with the risk map. That's what they used. With this tool, we're giving them every one of the parameters that goes into the risk model, some of which are very interpreted by regular people, not a fantastic mathematician. In other words, people understand what an ICN is. People understand what an original spraying is. And they can kind of start to connect the dots for their area of responsibility. The risk map that's calculated, what they're finding now, of course, some of those prevalence data are very poor quality. They never knew that before. But the quality varies, right? I mean, some places are very, some districts are very good about collecting it, and some are not. The point is, if all you have is the risk map, you have no way of assessing the quality of that risk map. Um, output, which means the dollars you're investing may not be going to where they're most acutely needed. So simply making transparent all of the parameters, they have already started to make their prevalence data collection routines more disciplined. Okay? In agriculture, it's going to be the same thing. By making the input to your model, even if the model is run in SAS or outside, anything to do with where, people are going to understand that geographically, the accuracy varies as well. I think that's a good thing to bring to the table. Okay. Sorry, can I ask a small supplementary question? Yeah. I, I can see why you know complex analysis is not necessary in here, but uh, some of the earlier data just showed yield trial data. Right. It, is the the case, and, and they were aggregated. Mm -hmm. So can you at least put standard errors or? Sure. Yeah. Within this. Absolutely. It's just another attribute. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no, the, the attribution, I mean, what we've done here is so simple because, in effect, we haven't worked with you yet. And this is, uh, we were just, uh, Leap and I were talking earlier this morning. The sequence of events is this is not a type of product that is, we're going to go away for seven months and then turn it on. Yes. As soon as any of your data start to come into this, sure. the, the core team is going to have access to it so that you all are giving feedback saying, hey, I need to put standard errors. I need to put proper um, scientific, if you will, rigor behind the metadata. Absolutely. And so those are the kinds of things uh, that this is enabled because as soon as there's a login for TL2 or a login for HOPE, you're going to be seeing your data and you can start to say, hey, this is my data, this is how I want it to be done, and that would be part of the iterations that come into play. Um, I think that's about all I really wanted to demonstrate. There's some other buttons here like this one. You can leave feedback immediately. Obviously, there could be a bug. I mean, things happen. Pardon? What are we? Oh, sorry. Um, obviously, as new data come into the universe of data, this is something that might be a data manager might say, OK, look, uh, we've found some really detailed this, or I pulled this from our Microsoft archive. I'd like to load it. As soon as it's loaded, you might get an email that says, try this out. You know, these different things are iterations. We're expecting feedback. I think, that's, I think that's about as far as I want to go here because I'm looking for the conversation side. I will then just turn this one on because um, 
the weather module is available to you now. Um, I have a, some, I can email to uh, delete a, a little how to do it, but it's actually very simple. I think it was, let's see, it was in the um, PowerPoint, I think, of this slide. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I just want to give you this because it's, it's a chance for these projects to at least um, uh, kind of get a feel for how, the, how they're going to be logging in. Okay, so if you're interested in any daily weather data, there's a 10 day forecast. The 10 day forecast covers all of those areas. Now, I will tell you that right now, you're not going to see a map when it loads. We're, we're dealing with terabytes of data here and getting the tiling to show up, meaning this a map like this of today's maximum temperature or something, is proving to be rather difficult computationally. So we're upgrading our data center and some things going on behind the scene. All the data is available, it just is not going to have a pretty picture yet, but then at some point in July, all of a sudden you'll log in and every day's weather map will be there. But what you're looking at, and then as you see from this enlargement, is there is a grid laid over all of this area. In every one of those locations, when you click on that, you will have a, it's like a weather station. It's interpolated, so the precip in particular is going to be weak, but it can be augmented. We are getting better. And we're, we're agnostic about weather data. If you all are collecting weather data in some of your field trials, let's add it to this, make the surfaces more accurate. Okay? John, it seems like it's a if that's what it shows at the moment, it excludes Sudan, that's right. Ethiopia, yeah. Nigeria, yeah. which are... Yeah. There are no data. No. Where did the, where, how did these data for those green areas get in there? Where did they we, come from? We purchase from an aggregator most of its weather, uh, weather stations at airports. Right. Okay. There's about 10,000 stations globally that we download every single day. From a separate guys, we buy a forecast for all the ones we're because you have to pay for forecasts for us separately. So we have forecasts for this area, this area, and this area. And the data are available every day, and that's when I can jump into the actual module where I just was. But, um, I mean, Monsanto's been buying our data for nine years, using it in their research for the US, where the station density is obviously greater. They're now buying it globally. The only reason why I say that is, look, we've, we've messed with this data a lot. It's as accurate as we can make it, and it will only get better, because like, here in Kenya, we're talking with the Syngenta Foundation. They have 22 automated weather stations spread across places where they're selling their products. And they're willing to make that data available in the charge. So we'll just pull it in, and the services will get better. I mean, that, that's just our job. That's one of those contextual things that we do. But I wanted to show you this tool because, once again, you see we have a big chart area, a map area, and a table area. So I downloaded this right before the meeting started. If you click on 2012, pull this to the end, you will see that it goes out to June 17th because this is the forecast. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a forecast of temperature and rainfall. This happens to be Eldorette. You can push the pin in anywhere, and it will give you the weather station for that elevation of that grid zone. That's what it's doing. So maybe this will be useful. I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and again, feedback, okay? There's also a curious thing here that might help some of your um, partners, some of your extension people. If you, um, let me jump, let me back up here so you kind of see a map of, big map. Okay, so let's just say you know the latitude, longitude, which you can type right in here, or you know the town name, because you can search by town name. Um, maybe perhaps someone give me a name of a town in Tanzania, something Moshi, perhaps. If you just type that, it will zoom, uh, it'll find it and take you to it. Okay? And so maybe you have a field travel there, or you know where down the road it is, and so you can, you know, it's down over here or something like that. If you click New Analysis, it will load the data. Once you've made a new analysis, if you come up here to Notifications, you will see that all of the analyses that I've been doing, you can tag them to send you an email every day with the 10-day forecast because it updates every day. So that might be useful, you know? Farmers being warned ahead of time a bit of rain is coming, things like that. We know the accuracy of the forecast isn't too bad because this is the, we purchased it from a company that that's what they do is these huge, and in India, there's actually a lot of anecdotal, because I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot. There's no such thing as an accurate forecast, because it all depends on what your question is. Yeah. I mean, I genuinely mean that. I'm not being facetious. <laughs> I mean, if your purpose is to target the spring or not spring of a chemical that washes off if it rains, so you don't want to spray if it's going to rain, that's a whole different business rule than if you're trying to decide when to plant and you have to have enough rain before you put the seed in the ground. So accuracy it's, depends on what your purpose is. Mm, and it, uh, mm. I, trust me, I've gone around and around on this as an ant climber guy. You, you, there's no such thing as absolute accuracy. It just doesn't happen because 
If you think of it this way, in a semi-arid area, if I predict 300 millimeters of rainfall and only 250 millimeters come, I'm only off by 50. But in a semi-arid area, that's absolutely critical. Whereas in a different place, I might say 700, 750 fell, and nobody cares. You see, the purpose, the absolute accuracy doesn't mean anything until you translate it to business. So anyways, you can set up notifications and, again, feedback. If there's something you would prefer different, just let us know. If there's missing data, if there's things like that. There's some good things this tool already does. So like as a demonstration, I'm going to turn off growing degree days. While we're doing that, John, mm -hmm. can I just follow up on my earlier question again? Sure. Ethiopia, Sudan, oh, Nigeria. Right. Yeah. Uh, is it that the data is not available or they are not willing to, to share and sell? Uh, they don't. I'm going to answer it correctly, I believe. They don't share to the global system. So even WMO does, gets no data from Nigeria no data from Ethiopia. Right. Ethiopia has terrific data. Absolutely, I know that for a fact because I used to work up there. But they won't? They, they just won't. don't contribute to the global system, so nobody gets data from Ethiopia. Now, that may change. And, and, and the Gates Foundation is putting a lot of money in Ethiopia. This trends, yeah. trend, trends, something. what's the word? Trends? Yeah. Well, we don't yeah. And one of the things they're pushing is saying, look, look what these guys can do, and, but it hasn't happened yet. And so we will, and, and by the way, the rainfall estimates are going to get much better. We are making an alliance with Colorado State University, which has connections to an Air Force effort that has nine, a constellation of nine satellites. And the satellites use a, pa the science is, you can look on the web, it uses a passive radar assessment of atmospheric conditions. It comes by about every, I don't know, 74 minutes or something like that. And they actually build a daily rainfall product, estimated product. 16 kilometer grid. We're going to start sucking that in. So now you really have a remote estimate of rainfall as opposed to an interpolated right. observed. Yeah. But that's going to come in when we, you know, we have to just do it. And, but it just gets better. One day it'll be there and you'll be able to choose. So here's a little thing about this tool. I have said that my season is March 1 to August 30th here in Eldoret. I have tagged to average all available years of data because that's that shows up here right now. There's only, I think, four years.